by the time you've taken one and you just took 60 milligrams of Valium, that's a ton. That's a ton of Valium. That'll black you out. And if you've had two or three drinks with it, you know, one of the problems with, uh, with Rehypnol more than anything else was, and as a person that had done that substance recreationally, you could take a pill and have a fairly good time. But if you took one drink, you were going to black out. I mean, plain and simple. And, you know, there was a, a there was a time, I'll tell this story because I don't think, um, I don't think the person I'm telling the story about <clears throat> would care. <clears throat> so I will tell this. And if he's in the audience, maybe he'll yell at me if I'm not supposed to tell this story. But uh, <clears throat> I used to go to Mexico and buy a lot of these. They were, uh, they were really a moneymaker back in the day because you could buy, it was like $14 a box. And um, the pills were going for anywhere from like 10 to $15 a piece when they first started to, to make the scene. So, you know, 30 in a box, it was a pretty good moneymaker. And uh, I ended up with about 40 or 50 boxes of these things. And I would sell them in 10 strips to, to uh, friends that would go into clubs and then mark them up and, and sell them whatever. And the, the issue got to the point where I started doing really screwy things. Like one day I woke up in the morning and at the time I drove a Saab 900 and <clears throat> I woke up in the morning, <clears throat> I had a little uh, coffee table. It was a wicker chest with a piece of glass over the top of it. And on the coffee table, I had hundred dollar bills, $50 bills, twenties, tens, fives, all the way down to ones. All of the money I had kind of organized, like it would be in a um, cash drawer, except it was just laying on a glass table. And I was sitting on the couch like Homer Simpson with my head back and my mouth wide open. And when I woke up, I looked at all the money and my front door was open. I lived in an apartment and the front door was open. And I thought you could see the money from the front door. I'm like, this is just stupid. So I went to go get into my bedroom and the door was locked. So I knocked on the door to yell at my wife for not closing the front door. And she opened the bedroom door and just looked at me with this look and said, are you kidding? And I thought, oh man, I'm in trouble. I had an IBM ThinkPad. It was a laptop. It was about that thick. It was, I mean, the thing weighed a metric ton. It was one of the first IBM. It didn't have a mouse. It had a little stick with a little red, red ball on the top that you kind of use. You know, it's totally different than, than any of the, the laptops today. It was in the freezer. It was in the freezer, which didn't make a whole lot of sense. It didn't do a whole lot of good for the uh, the laptop either. Everything, everything was screwed up. My keys were in the microwave oven. I had no memory of any of the things that I did. But when I went to shut the door, there was an eviction notice taped to it. And I said to my wife, is there a reason we're evicted? She said, it's probably your parking job last night. I said, we're getting evicted because of my parking job. People, I drove my sob to the front door of my apartment. And if you've ever been in like a nice apartment complex where the, you know, the trails kind of wind around trees. So when you leave the parking lot, there's a walking path that might be 150 feet with a bunch of turns and things like that. Well, I just drove up it and I parked my car right near the front door, left the, the door of my car open. There was no fixing this. I couldn't go down to them and say, normally when I screwed up, I would go down and tell them I would pay seven or eight months rent all at once. And I'm really, really sorry. No, I was gone. Evicted. So that's not the point of the story, by the way. Point of the story was I realized just how badly these things were for me. The fact that I could black out that badly and had no memory of anything that I did. So I boxed them up and I sent them to somebody in another state. And since, ah, hell, I sent them to Johnny. I packaged them up and I sent them to Johnny and I, I sent them with a bit of a warning letter that just said, man, I can't have these things that they will absolutely erase your memory. And about four weeks later, maybe a little bit more than that, they came back. <laughs> Johnny packaged up the ones that he had not taken and sent them back to me. Now at the time he'd been working a very straight job and he wasn't partying at the end of the day. He would go home, he would take one of these, he'd drink a few beers or whatever, and, but then he would black out and one night he wrote himself a letter basically chastising himself for all of the things that he was doing. Think of it as journaling, but just on a piece of paper. Well, when he woke up in the morning, there was a letter telling him what an idiot he was, written by him that he had no memory of writing. So he packaged them all back up, put them in a box, and sent them back to me with a letter that said, don't ever, ever send me anything like this again. Now, imagine the damage that a freak could do with that kind of substance. <clears throat> 